Hello and welcome to Talking It History, the podcast where we, Matt, and Max talk about works of alternate history, alternate history scenarios, and history in general. This episode, we're going to be talking about a delightful short story compilation, but plot twist here, it's not a Peter Saras short story compilation. Oh no. Alternate Presidents, edited by Mike Resnick. Yes. And this is a book from the early 90s, and it's got 28 different stories, and very interesting variety of them. Yes, a very interesting variety. Hard swings between some of them, I'll yes. just say. <laughs> I agree. But uh, it's, a, it's a good collection, and it covers people who were president, but their presidencies are different, but also covers people who weren't president, who become president. Mm -hmm. So, and the stories are, some of them are quite long, some of them are quite short, mm -hmm. but they're uh, it's interesting varieties. So we want to talk about a few of them. We're not going to talk about all of them. Mm, yeah, this episode would be like three hours long if we yeah. tried doing that. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to talk about ones that we found really interesting or really memorable or whatever. So, uh, and we're, we're going to go, you know, vaguely, chronologically in order, but we'll just talk about whatever. Mm -hmm. The first story in this compilation is named Father of His Country, which is about Benjamin Franklin becoming mm -hmm. president. And I think we forgot one last thing is, is that each one is set by a, an election year pretty much. Mm -hmm. So each one has like a year, like the 1800 election, the 1804 election, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Not all elections are covered. Not all elections are equally is interesting or important. <laughs> very true, very true. And also, some of them do a kind of blindside you because they don't actually take place anywhere near where the divergence happens. There's one much later, there's one involving Hoover's re-election. But the story doesn't have anything to do with Hoover, really. Yeah. So, so it's each artist's choice, I guess. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Writer's choice. Writer's choice. Exactly. So, father of his country. So Benjamin Franklin becomes president, that Congress decides that it should elect someone who isn't a general. Yeah, and th this is the first election yeah. ever. 1789. So this is when George Washington was elected, mm -hmm. you, who won the you know the biggest margin to become president, only unanimous winner of the Electoral College. But here, a lot of these stories, some, some of the changes are pretty implausible, like this one. Like, it's hard to imagine anyone but George Washington. But for the sake of argument, Benjamin Franklin becomes president. And it's kind of a funny story. Um in it, Benjamin Franklin becomes president, and he continues writing as he did in his life prolifically. But as president, they see it as kind of improper for the president to be writing these editorials and stuff. So he starts using pseudonyms and pen names. And, and kind mm -hmm. of the upshot of this presidency is that the office of president becomes much more of a populist man of the people kind of thing. He's able to sway public opinion and make people feel like they should actually be represented by their government instead of just installing aristocrats, basically, who just do whatever the hell they want. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's actually written in this one. It's written in this. It's a epistolary yeah. story. <laughs> uh, it's actually written in the form of letters from John Adams to Abigail Adams. And he basically spends the whole time being like, I hate Benjamin Franklin. Nah. And he talks about his cousin, Sam. Samuel Sam's. Adams is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's an interesting one. The, the part that I have a little bit trouble with is that by 1789, Benjamin Franklin, I think, died in 1790. So this is also <laughs> somehow he has better health. And also, Benjamin Franklin was born in 1707, I think. So he would have been well into his 80s by 1789. <laughs> this is also the 1700s, and someone in their 80s, that's pretty freaking old. Um, it'd be pretty hard to see someone have the amount of energy to be president. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the interesting thing about this is I think that it does pick about the only other person who probably had the stature within the colonies to become the first president. I mean, I think truly George Washington was the really only clear choice. Yeah. But if there wasn't George Washington, I think Benjamin Franklin would have been the only other person of sufficient renown and reputation that he could have been president. Because I think that John Adams was seen somewhat, maybe rightfully so, as too regional. Yeah. Although, on top of that, if you haven't seen the John Adams uh, short series from about 10 years ago, watch it. So good. It's so good. It's so good. Paul, Paul Giamatti. Giamatti. It's awesome. Yeah. But um, yeah. And then Thomas Jefferson, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I think really the only people with the sort of Franklin would have been probably the next choice. Although given his age, it didn't seem likely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of implied at the end that John Adams, who is Franklin's VP, mm -hmm. is really looking forward to his death because that means he gets to be president right afterwards. So. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Hooray. Yeah. But a good story. The next story I absolutely love, The War of 07. 
The point of divergence is the election of 1800, and uh, it's kind of a alternate version of 1812, the War of 1812, but with Aaron Burr as president. <laughs> and it's it's such a great story. It's written a little strangely. There'll be parts where he's talking to someone, and it'll just say that person's name, colon, and then just a big paragraph of dialogue between the two of them. Like, it's not written in a traditional way, but it's a lot of fun. It is a yeah. lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Aaron Burr is just like this evil genius manipulating everyone around him to do what he wants, and it's just great. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's interesting because I think, you know, Aaron Burr is one of these fascinating characters of early American history who has gotten, I guess, more attention because of Hamilton. Yeah. But, I mean, he basically tried to start a country, like in the, another country in the United States. That's right. Like, which is crazy to think. But here it's just... I mean, this story does a good job of when you go into these divergences, you just go crazy. For some of the Syrah stuff, I like how they keep it pretty close to the bone, mm -hmm. like not too crazy. But sometimes I do like one of these where it's just, you know what? We're throwing it all out. We're just going for broke. Kind of reminds me of that story we did for the Napoleon options. I think it was Race for Borisov Bridge or yeah. something like that, mm -hmm. where just things just went completely nuts in, in at the very end of the story. And that's kind of how it is here because Aaron Burr, uh, becomes president with the help of Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton is his secretary of war because he's given the choice between either treasury secretary or war secretary. He goes for war. And uh, in his presidency, he just jacks up the debt through military expenditure. But it's all part of his master plan because he wants to get in super deep in debt with Great Britain so that Great Britain will then try to provoke them which they do through impressing sailors, which is what they did. In the in, War of 1812. Yeah, during the War of 1812. Uh, that, that gets Britain to cause an incident, which Aaron takes advantage of, starts a war, and kicks the crap out of them because Britain is distracted by the Peninsular Campaign in Spain during the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And also they use versions of that Bushnell submarine, which is crazy. Like, have you ever seen those things? It's crazy. <laughs> Fun fact about those things. So because they had a closed air system, and this was before light bulbs, in order to read their instruments, they, they couldn't use candles or yeah. whatever. So they used foxfire mushrooms, luminescent mushrooms. And that's crazy. So, so like they had this gluten, like this green light inside the uh, the turtle. That's amazing. It's so. Cool. I did not know that. See, that's oh, that's that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. No, and, but and it never worked, right? It, they never used it. No, properly. they tried to, and it, it damaged a British ship in the Revolutionary War. But I mean, the problem is, is it had a guy. One guy had to hand crank the damn thing. You'd have to be immensely strong and have incredible stamina to do it. It just wasn't going to work. But I, I like it too. And also, Aaron Burr becomes permanent president. <laughs> that's right. He they they. Instead of an inauguration, it's called, I think, a anointing or something, <laughs> or a coronation. Yeah. And he has his own son become his vice president, and his grandson becomes the next president, and it's just, it's craziness. Yeah. Oh, and he marries Pauline Bonaparte, which is really funny. Even though she was already, already married to some Italian guy, yeah. she just gets a divorce and marries him <laughs> instead. It's pretty funny. <laughs> and then the, the British burn Washington, D.C. and something like that during it. It's just crazy. Yeah. But, but but that burning was all part of his master plan as well. <laughs> it's like, because after it happens, he smirks to himself and is like, <laughs> He's got the foresight of the emperor in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. No. Like, like uh, Hamilton's wife dies because she runs back into the Capitol to get the, uh, the Constitution or whatever. Oh, jeez. And then... Alexander Hamilton swears revenge. Ah, revenge. Ah, I'll get you Great Britain. <laughs> How dare you? That's crazy, man. It's just, um, yeah, it's a good story. It's, it might be my favorite one in mm -hmm. this entire it's a collection. Good one. Yeah. Uh, then there's a couple are about Andrew Jackson, and the divergences in them are really kind of a little bit harder to track. So when we're reading through at least one of them, it's like hard to actually tell what the divergence is. So yeah, the black, black earth and destiny. Or yeah. Whatever. I was like, not really sure what the diver. I mean, I, the divergence is, is that Andrew Jackson becomes president in 1824, but I'm not sure what <laughs> that, that affects. <laughs> right. It's they don't it make almost, it clear. It almost seems completely unrelated to the whole alternate president's theme. You know, it's just George Washington Carver talking about earthworms and like, Oh, Oh, okay. nitrogen in the soil uh oh cool uh okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
And then um, what's next? Oh, How the South Preserved the Union. It's an 1848 election. What a title. Uh, <laughs> well, that one's going to get attention. Um, so in this story, Zachary Taylor, who, you know, died in office in reality, dies way sooner in office than he did in real life. He's in like a carriage with our boy, Millard Fillmore. Uh, they're like, <laughs> right after the inauguration, they get in a carriage with each other and they drive down the road and it just pummels into an icy lake and they both just die right there. So Yikes. uh <laughs> David R. Atchison becomes president. Well, yeah, he and David Atchison is this person that some people will claim like, ooh, super cool trivia, guys. This guy was president for one day. Not really. Zachary Taylor went take the oath of office on March the 4th, but he was a Speaker of the House. And so this guy, like technically, I get, sorry, President Pro Temp, um, I'm thinking the post 25th Amendment where it is the Speaker of the House. He becomes president and then just everything goes crazy. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. So he becomes a Whig for some reason. I guess just in the spirit of fairness, I'm just going to switch my political party for you guys. <laughs> and Henry Clay is like, yay, hooray. Yeah, oh, hip, hip, hooray. Thank you. Um, they should have had a Henry Clay. They don't have a Henry Clay divergence in this one, which is crazy because yeah. that's someone who absolutely wanted to be president and really probably could have been. Totally. If he yeah. had the right timing. No John Quincy Adams related one either. Uh uh-uh. uh. John Quincy? John Quincy, a.k.a. Who, who 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 played him in Amistad? Oh, Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. That's who it was. That's who it was. Sir Anthony. What a guy. What a guy. But yeah, this one basically the North secedes <laughs> from from the United States, and John Brown leads it, and there's a whole bunch of fighting, and the South eventually, you know, brings the North back into the fold. But the thing about it is, is that. Stephen Douglas becomes president and he ends slavery in 1861, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if the South was fighting to reunite the the Union, probably not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, this story is a, a little odd, I'll <laughs> just say. Like a, a president at President Atchison issues a proclamation saying that all the slaves in the plantations, you need to work in factories instead. And after you're done, after the war is over, you're all free. It's like, wouldn't all the slaveholders be like, um, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that didn't seem that didn't seem very likely. The the justification the author has is this war is actually being influenced by the industrialists in the north. They're just trying to take over the South. <laughs> they want to keep the South down, you see. It's not about slavery at all. It's just about economics. That's that's all. <laughs> oh, which <goodness>. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um yeah. also Custer becomes president, and also Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill becomes president of the United Buffalo States. Buffalo Bill. Oh, Ted Levine. <laughs> <laughs> president Levine. Um, no, but why would uh, Buffalo Bill Hickok become president? That makes no sense. It just That's just like one of those where you just change something just for the sake of yeah. it. And Annie Oakley is his VP, <laughs> Secretary of State Sitting Bowl. <laughs> exactly. Good. Like, um, but, there's a, but there's a lot of like interesting parallels in it. But it like there's a battle at Gettysburg and stuff like that. And, yeah, you know. yeah. Atlanta gets burned, you know that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. but it's yeah, not bad. But it's just kind of an interesting one. Pretty wild, pretty wild and crazy that one. Mm-hmm. And the next, the next one is now falls the cold, cold night, which is 1856 election, and James Buchanan by it dies before the election. So Millard Fillmore, yeah, becomes president again. Your boy, yes. yeah, the boy Millard Fillmore from the Know Nothing Party. Yeah, a.k.a. the America Party. The American Party that people nowadays know nothing about. Know nothing about at all. Exactly. Um, Except for the film Kings of New York. That had know nothing stuff in it. It did a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. the plug uglies and dead yeah, rabbits. versus the dead rabbits and all that, yeah. yeah. But um, the point is, is that, again, this is another North secedes the New England Confederacy. And uh, the North wins in this one. The, no, the North wins because they they hang Robert E. Lee. Uh, his last words before death is "The Union forever." Oh. <laughs> it's it's, oh a, it's a pretty wacky one because like yeah. so Millard Fillmore, the the Know Nothing Party is like this ultra ultra anti Catholic anti immigrant party, mm-hmm. and like that's that causes a lot of anger and frustration with all the Irish people and whatnot living in mm-hmm. the North. And that what leads to the beginnings of secession. Mm-hmm. I think it's what Massachusetts is the first to secede or something, yeah, something like, like that. that yeah. um, and then, then another one, another kind of civil war related one is Lincoln's charge. And this stems from, this one's a good one. It's interesting. It's a little bit more military related, but basically Lincoln doesn't do the debates with Stephen Douglas. And because of that, Stephen Douglas becomes president in 1860. But the South still secedes, probably because the 
Uh, my guess is probably that the, the Congress is still Republican. Hmm. So that's still going to force, you know, sort of force a war. And it's interesting because it's talking at the beginning about how like Washington, D.C. is under siege by like Robert E. Lee. Kentucky secedes, becomes part of the, the Confederacy. And because of that, a lot of the war is being fought in like Ohio and Illinois. You know, it's not, just a quick side note about that. Mm -hmm. The Confederate flag has, I believe, 13 stars. It does. Did not have 13 states, though. No, because it counted Kentucky and Missouri. Even though it, even though they never actually joined no, the Confederacy. Had, like, no, yeah. although like each one had like basically like a shadow government. Hmm. Um, although part, big parts of Missouri in 1861 were under Confederate control, and certainly parts of Kentucky, but hmm. nowhere near as much. But basically in this one, Lincoln becomes a general in the Union Army, and he leads this charge and all that stuff. And then... Is that really plausible for Lincoln to go from a, like a guy who was in the Black Hawk War and was not a very good leader to being a general? Yeah, like, well, you know, in the sense of like maybe in professional soldier, he wouldn't have been a good professional soldier. But you have to remember, this is something that people probably don't know or aware is as much. But a lot of military appointments, especially towards the beginning in the Civil War, were political appointments. Hmm. Benjamin Butler, the famous Spoons Butler, the guy who <laughs> uh, who is the military governor of New Orleans. Like, he was a political appointment. Like, a lot of uh, big generals at the beginning were appointed because of their political connections. Mm -hmm. So this is, that's not unbelievable that he would be appointed because he still would have been a prominent politician in Illinois, and Illinois would have been a prominent state in the, you know, in the Union. So no military experience at all? No idea Some what people doing? had almost none, yeah. That's insane. Uh -huh. that's... And it's interesting enough, some of them actually in the, at Gettysburg, there was a, the 11th Corps was one of the Union fighting units there. It was pretty much destroyed on the first day of Gettysburg. It was actually large chunks of it were made up of units made up of German emigres. And some of the commanders of those units were actually well-known veterans of the 1848 revolutions in Europe. And they'd come over. That's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carl Schurz. Well, was it Franz Siegel or was he still there at that time? I don't know. Some of them were like veterans of, of that. And they huh. had a lot of sway in the German-American community, which was actually quite a large immigrant community at that time in the United States. Hmm. So. Uh, so, that has nothing to do with Lincoln being a general, <laughs> but it's an interesting side note. But just a quick question about mm -hmm. that again is that like, so there's a lot of Irish people who fight for the Union, a lot of German people, as you said. Did they even speak English? Or Some of them did. Some didn't. I mean, it's interesting. Like I, had a, I have a book buried somewhere where it had a good breakdown on different units if they were majority immigrant. You know, some of them, there was like one that was like heavily Hungarian or like partially really? Hungarian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But a lot were German and Irish, heavily Irish, meaning there's the Irish Brigade, which was made up of units that were primarily made up, primarily made up of Irish Americans or Irish immigrants. You see them in Gods and Generals. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They have a big like scene where they're fighting like this Irish unit that's from Georgia, and they're all just getting killed. Did the Confederacy have a lot of uh, foreign people? Not as much. Not as much. They had some, but not as much. What about Texas? I know Texas had some, tons of. Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, there were, but there was the the immigrant population, which much higher in the north because that's where the industry was. Right in the big cities, and yeah, whatnot. in the big cities, yeah, yeah. Because the biggest city in the Confederacy was New Orleans, and gets captured in eighteen sixty two. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. huh. yeah. Huh. But it's a good it's a good story, and all ultimately Lincoln dies in the end in this charge and all that, but he like saves the Union. So yeah, one way or another, Lincoln was going to save the Union. Damn it. <laughs> It's fate. It's it has fate. to happen. But no mention of Hannibal Hamlin, though. That's Lincoln's vice president, by the way, in real life. You know, Hannibal Hamlin is also a character in Fallout 3. Really? Yeah, really. Because <laughs> okay. Fallout 3 takes place in Washington, D.C., and there's like the Lincoln Memorial or whatever, and people mm -hmm. worship the statue of Lincoln as a god, and they name themselves after people they find in history books they don't understand the history they don't know what really happened but they just see the names and it's like oh the holy lincoln ah because they're slaves in fallout 3 so it's like you know he's the emancipator, the emancipator the, the great, great emancipator the great emancipator yeah <laughs> i love that kind of stuff that that stuff's fun that's pretty yeah, that's high level what else do we have oh another one of my favorites i shall have a fight to glory it's from the 1880 election basically Long story short is that the 1876 election was pretty much stolen from Samuel Tilden, the Democratic yeah. candidate. Wasn't it like a tie or something? Pretty much. Samuel Tilden won the the popular vote across the country, but a commission was set up to settle the election. And basically, the Republicans on the commission struck a deal with the Democrats and said, if we elect our guy president, we will end Reconstruction. Huh. And that's what happened. Reconstruction ends in 1877 because of that. The corrupt bargain. Yeah, just like John Quincy Adams. You know, yeah, because he was it's the same thing. It was settled in the House of Representatives instead of by the popular vote. 
Yeah, so Tilden probably actually had won the election, but they elected Rutherford Hayes, also known as Rutherford Hayes, oh. to some of us. <laughs> I don't know about you. Rutherford. <laughs> yeah, and you, his. You know, they love him in Paraguay, though. Do they? Oh, that's right, because he ended that war in which Paraguay was like obliterated because it declared war on like every country around it. He said, this is where the border should be. You can go to Asuncion, and what? that's the capital of Paraguay, Asuncion. Huh. I'm sure they have something named after him there. How do you spell that, though? A-S-C-U-N-C-I-O-N. Ascension, like, you know, Jesus oh, ascending. Oh, okay, Asuncion. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Trivia day, guys. Um, <laughs> um, but but so basically, long story short, most uh, historians would agree Samuel Tilden, the election was stolen from 1876. Well, in this one, it's an 1880 election. Rutherford Hayes, Rutherford Hayes is not running for another term. Tilden decides to run in this one instead of Garfield. He does some of the same stuff that happened to him in 1876. So he basically wins, cuts a deal with the Republicans. And Garfield thinks that's not okay. And Garfield starts hanging out with Odie. I mean, just just kidding. <laughs> with Nermal. <laughs> Garfield starts hanging out with Charles Gateau, who's the guy who assassinated him in real life. And in this, basically, Gateau talks him into, like, you have to stop this. You have to kill Tilden. The end of it is Garfield with a gun in his pocket, marching up, tears in his eyes, into the Capitol building to, to assassinate <laughs> Samuel Tilden. And this isn't that funny, I guess, in a way, but it just is ridiculous because... Charles Gateau was a madman in real life. Yeah, he had no ideological bent to him. He just killed somebody just to be famous, right? Is that what happened? No, he thought he should be minister to France. Okay. He kind of bothered Garfield a lot about it. And Garfield was like, you know, go to Abu Dhabi. Another Garfield <laughs> joke. Um, <laughs> man, we are just killing it today. Um, no, Garfield was like, no, man, you're just another one of those office seekers, whatever. Yeah. And that's why I shot him. Huh. Oh, wait, yeah, didn't he just walk into the White House or something? No, he shot him at a train station in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And Garfield was on the platform, and Gateau walked up and shot him. But it took a long time for Garfield to die. In fact, it took him a couple weeks, I think. And interestingly enough is that they actually tried all these things to try and locate the bullet. The medical care of him afterwards may have actually killed Garfield. The infection coming from them, like, probing at it with their fingers and stuff like oh, that. Oh, God. Yeah, the wound. But... Actually, at one point, Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, came with like a rough early approximation of a metal detector to see if they could find it. Whoa. But the bed he was on had springs, metal springs uh. in it. So it just messed the whole damn thing up. Come on. But either way, this one is kind of crazy to think Charles Gateau and this is like Garfield's friend, sort of, mm, and yeah. convinces him to go nuts. Garfield and friends, you could even say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I was a really, really big fan of Garfield. Like, uh, I used to cut out Garfield comics I thought were funny and put them in a scrapbook. <laughs> Which is why it's empty. And then... <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> ah! Throwing some shade right there. What's the guy's name? Jim Davis? Jim Davis. Ah, we're yeah. calling you out, Jim. Jim. Find us. <laughs> I, I used to bring it to school and show it to people. It's Aww. like, oh, look at this. Yeah. Oh. Actually, what I think is even funnier than Garfield is Garfield without Garfield, which is that thing online yeah. where they take Garfield out of it. And actually, some of them work really well. Yeah. It's yeah. basically watching John devolve into madness. Because Garfield never says anything. He just thinks things. Yeah. He's a cat. He can't talk. Yeah. You know, John and Garfield never actually speak to one another. Something that, Something Garfield, that Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties, overlooks. Really? He's just thinking. Well, because he talks in it. Oh, God. Who's in that film? Bill Murray. Bill Murray is in that film. He is Garfield in that movie. Yowza. We all got to eat, Max. We all got to eat. <laughs> we all got to eat that lasagna sometimes. <laughs> hey, there's a Monday every week, man. That's just life. <laughs> now, welcome to the Garfield podcast. Yeah. What's your favorite Garfield comic? You know, <laughs> mine's the one where he kicks Odie off the table. Yeah. That one's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. We should get out of our day job, start while writing Garfield fan fiction. Ooh, yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of that on the internet. <laughs> I have no doubt that there is. I could look it up later. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. So what next, Max? What's next? Uh... Uh, this is a short story written by the editor, Mike Resnick, and it's called The Bull Moose at Bay. This is all about the 1912 election where, mm -hmm. you know, for those who don't know, Theodore Roosevelt ran for two terms. Isn't that right? Two terms. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, he took over in 1901 when McKinley, McKinley was, was, yeah. McKinley which, was, by the way, no McKinley story. What I are you know. doing? 
No, Leon Kolgosh, forgotten. Ugh, good, good, good. I'm glad. Do you know what happened to Leon Kolgosh after he got executed? Yeah, they dissolved him in a bath of acid. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, with lime. Yeah, pretty much. What a jerk! Look, I just want to. I just want to say something right here, and that is that. Why did you kill McKinley? There's no reason. He wanted to name it Denali. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> It's like, so he's an anarchist, right? Yeah. So he's like, I hate the government. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate the institution of government. So I'm going to kill the president of the United States. And it's like, of all the governments in the world, the United States is it's like the a, most responsive to its people. I mean, yeah, it wasn't as responsive as it is now, but like, we're talking relative here, people. It's 1901. Yeah. It's not like you're killing the king of Italy or, or the, the czar. czar. Yeah, yeah. The czar. You want to talk about an autocratic regime? Like, holy crap. Czar Peter, I think. Wasn't he the one that got killed or whatever? Or is that someone else? No, Alexander II. Alexander II. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's, 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 it, and then like, it's like, oh, the propaganda of the deed. Well, the propaganda of the deed is stupid. It's not accomplishing anything. You're just killing an innocent person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just stupid. No, yeah. Well, it's just one of those things where it didn't make sense. But so in this one, 1812 election, bull move. Remember, this is 1812 election is really interesting because it's the only election since the Democratic and Republican parties have become the primary parties in the United States that a third party actually came second in mm -hmm. the elections. It was the Democrats came first and then the Bull Moose Party. And poor old William Howard Taft came poor in guy. third. Did he become a Supreme Court? Yeah, he became the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And in fact, he liked it. Way better than being president. In fact, he said at one point, he said, I hardly even remember being president in my former life. <laughs> That's great. What a guy. Yeah. What a He's guy. actually like an interesting figure. Doesn't get that much attention other than the fact that people think he was stuck in a bathtub. Yes. He was the fattest president. He was also the governor of the Philippines. He was. He did a lot. Secretary of War and... He rode a water buffalo once. There's a picture of him. <laughs> How'd the buffalo feel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and his son became the great yeah. Robert Taft. The great Bob Taft. Who almost no one knows. Yeah. Very influential figure, but again, no one knows. Just like Henry Clay. He was one of those yeah. guys that like never became president, but was extremely influential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Henry Clay. What a guy. What a guy. What a monster face. What, what a face. <laughs> <laughs> the Democratic Republicans did this to me. <laughs> Quincy, <laughs> rise, <laughs> Darth Adams. <laughs> the oppression of the Whigs will not stand. <laughs> oh my God. But but really, he looked terrible in that picture. <laughs> he looked so bad. <laughs> Look, back then, politics wasn't about looks. It really know? wasn't. It wasn't. If you, if you track the meter of, there's that thing where it shows the taller person usually wins a presidential election. Mm -hmm. If you look at a comparison when the shorter candidate usually won, it really was in the time before mass media mm -hmm. or the time before people really knew what presidents looked like. I mean, what are they doing? Taking around a portrait of the president everywhere they went? Like, this is what this is the man. <laughs> the icon. <laughs> Everyone bow before the icon of Woodrow <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> well, no, that one they had pictures. But I'm talking okay. like the 1820s, oh, right, you right. know, stuff like that. And, um, and yet Franklin Pierce was able to win. He was know. the handsomest president we ever had, he was, according to DR. He was that handsome, you know. Oh, I mean, look at him. Is that, How can you say? What we do in life echoes in eternity. You That's know? right. <laughs> now there's nothing left to do but to get drunk. To get drunk. So yeah, you have the, the, the 1912 election. So in this one, Teddy Roosevelt wins, which is actually not an incredibly crazy divergence. Because the divergence is that in real life, Theodore Roosevelt was actually shot while campaigning. So he was mm -hmm. out of commission for a long time, during which he could have been going around the country, meeting with people and whatnot. But, but, but in this story, the divergence is that the assassin totally misses him. So he's in perfect health, he's totally fine, and he vigorously continues his campaign and wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which and then the United States gets involved in the war against Germany in World War One much earlier, and that ends the war earlier for some reason. Yeah, it ends in a single year, which what? How? Like how? Hmm. Like how? Though, and it says the war against Germany. It doesn't say the war against Germany, Austria, and Turkey. It's 
And Bulgaria. And Bulgaria, of course, yeah. And with Portugal as with well. With Portugal, that's right. Integral part of World War One. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, I, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, to be no, honest with you. Doesn't. How can you end, well... I guess you can end World War One in a single year. Like that's not completely impossible. In nineteen fourteen, maybe, but not nineteen like fifteen or sixteen. Yeah, exactly. So mm-hmm. that one, this one was it was okay. You it's know? it's a little odd. I mean, mm-hmm. Mike Resnick, he's the editor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'd think that the editor would write the story where he could do the most fun, wacky, crazy thing, like how Sir Ross does. Like in Cold War Hot, he did Red Lightning, which is crazy. <laughs> that that story is nuts. Or like, um, what is it? Uh, I can't remember exactly which one it is, but it's the one where Saint Rommel. They yeah, call it the Saint, the red, the one where he defeats like the Russian offensive in forty five. Third Reich victorious, right? In Third Reich victorious, it's the yeah. last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just beats him single handedly. It makes a separate piece with the allies, and it just can do no wrong. <laughs> it, um, so Ross, he he always chooses an interesting crazy story and fills it with his fake footnotes and whatnot resnick like what all this story is is that tr is walking around his summer home during his birthday party just talking about how yeah you know i'm gonna lose my re-election because i care about civil rights too much i want to give the vote to women and uh african americans here in america okay that's fine but then it just ends it just ends oh actually the end of the story is that he speaks to his cousin franklin's wife and it's like oh yeah how do you feel about this issue and it's like oh well i would like suffrage for women and so does my husband and maybe he'll be president one day and it's like uh uh-huh. eh, wink and a nudge yeah hey. also franklin's walking around at this point yeah no polio yet N- not yet but that'll come in a, not until 1921 in a later story coming up later ah uh-huh. yeah yeah but but all i'm saying is that this is a story where you got one World War One and two Theodore Roosevelt, and you don't really do a lot with either of them. It's just a pretty forgettable story. Come on, Mike. Come yeah, on. That's you okay. Can, I'm sure you can do better. Yeah. Which one's next? The next story is Fireside Chat. The divergence is the 1920 election, and this is actually kind of a neat little factoid here, but as we know, our boy Warren G. Harding Warren Gamaliel Harding Gamaliel. won that election. Oh, he did. But Big time. All he does is win, 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 no matter what. Yeah, that's who DJ Khaled was talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With Warren Harding. I mean, Warren Harding, he really does live that lifestyle. He's he's very much like that. <laughs> he pretty much was. He did everything but be president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he shook hands with Babe Ruth. He did. You know, great stuff. He but, had sex in the White House closets with his mistress, who that actually was his child. The child that Nan Britton had was actually his child. And for the longest time, because he had mumps when he was an adult, people thought he was sterile for a long time because mumps oftentimes causes men to be sterile. But they did some DNA tests and it, it, with some distant relative of Harding's, and they pretty much showed that that kid was his. Hmm. So he, Well, you know, he had a lot of chances to try. He did, yeah. Because he wasn't actually doing anything while he was president. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was gambling yeah. and drinking a lot you know, as well. He once, he, um, he actually, this is this shows how much the world has changed in 98 years. Is that when Warren Harding was president? He'd answer the door of the White House sometimes when people would come up and knock on it. <laughs> Could you imagine that? <laughs> Just being able I mean, to walk People up. used to be able to do that for the longest time. It's like the president would have times where you could come and make an appointment and come and speak with the mm-hmm. president. It's like in Wild Wild West when Jim West just walks up to the front door of the White House and points a gun at Pinkerton's face and just walks into the Oval Office. Yeah. It's crazy. It was just like that. It was exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, but really it's it's um that that really that's really the way it was. I mean, you know. Mm. So which is was pretty crazy. But in this one, Harding has a stroke and he dies, and then James Cox becomes the front runner, and then he gets killed by this anti League of Nations guy. Stabs him in the heart multiple times. It's Ooh. like we will never join the League of Nations ever. Which is funny because the League of Nations never did anything, so it's <laughs> just about as useless as a baby. It just it's no matter if you're not in it or not. Um, but FDR becomes president, and then. But uh, but if if America is part of the League of Nations, I mean, maybe at that point it could actually do something. I mean. Mm-hmm. The fact that America wasn't part of the League of Nations was a big reason why nobody took it seriously. Yeah, partially. 
But also because it just didn't do anything. It just didn't and, do and anything. And no one was really willing to put military power behind it, which I think is why the UN had credibility, at least initially, mm. after the Second World War, is because they believed that the United States and other countries would actually use military force if needed. After all, the Korean War was technically a United Nations peacekeeping operation. Yeah, UN police action. Yeah, and Soviet Union could have vetoed it, but they didn't because they were protesting something. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, they, they were not, yeah. Which is extremely foolish. Stalin... Jogi, what are you doing? <laughs> Yosub. What's what's wrong what are you doing? with you? What would your mother say? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um and then basically in this, FDR becomes president, but Hitler also rises to power in the twenties, and then he and FDR meet and they have this weird long conversation. A very long conversation. Very long, very boring. I hate to say it. Yeah, kind of. And at the end of it, it makes no sense because the upshot of their conversation is that they agree that the United States and Germany should become allies. Hmm. It's like, what? Why? <laughs> why? In, why indeed? I mm-hmm. guess because it's the only way to safeguard peace or whatever, which mm-hmm. no, I don't think so. Yeah. Also, they mentioned that the Soviet Union has fallen. And it's reverted back to old Russia because Estonia is an independent country. And st- wait, no. Well, no, Estonia was an independent country until 1940. You're right. Because actually, it's the Soviet Union absorbed that eastern part of Poland before it absorbed the Baltic states, which is really crazy. Yeah. So, like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, all independent countries until 1940. Hmm. Pretty crazy, huh? It is pretty nuts. We need to get those numbers up in the Baltic states, Max. Right. Keep talking yeah. about it's Estonia. Estonia. Now on the Estonia podcast. Um, you know. <laughs> You know, I love the colors blue, black, and white. They're great. Um, uh, Lithuania. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna come out here. I'm just gonna say it. I think Lithuania's flag is bad. Uh, look at that tricolor. Look at it. When you see that tricolor, what do you think of? Do you think of Lithuania, or do you think like, oh, is that Mozambique's flag? Oh, is that you know? It just looks like a random tri. It's like it's not like France. France is the classic tricolor. You know. Mm-hmm. This is just you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, and if you look at the old Lithuanian flag, the guy on the horse or whatever, it looks awesome. It looks so cool. Why did why did why did you abandon that awesome flag to be this thing? Oh man, we made a lot of Lithuanians angry. I think. I think I so. Hope, I hope multiple time world strongest man Zdrinis Saviskis doesn't come to get us. Oh no. <laughs> what what's your feelings on Latvia? Latvia, it's um. I don't. I don't know much about Latvia. Okay. I know Riga. That's a that's a city there. That's it's true. got that interesting peninsula, the Kurland Peninsula. I know a lot of Germans lived there before. Those Baltic Germans lived in Latvia. I'm gonna blow your mind here for a second. Kurland had colonies in the New World. They tried to colonize Trinidad. When? In like I think the 16 or 1700s or something like that. Hmm. It obviously didn't actually end up working, but it's just like how the Russians built a fort in... in uh, California, right? California and or in Hawaii. Hawaii. Both of them, actually. I, I didn't know that. Corland, of all the places. Of all the places. <laughs> Latvia, I don't know much about. Uh, it's just sort of like that redheaded stepchild of the hmm. Baltic states. It's not the Polish-Latvian Commonwealth. Yeah, it's a Polish-Lithuanian <laughs> Commonwealth. That's right. Not Polish-Estonian. No. It's not. No. Mm-mm. No. Uh uh-uh. uh. No. Uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh. No, but it's uh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. It is interesting. We do like to get on our tangents. Uh, but Fireside, but uh, you know, this, this story's okay, I suppose. Mm-hmm. FDR's in a wheelchair at this point because it's mm-hmm. after. Yeah, after you got polio in 1921. How do you get polio? It's airborne, I think. It's through like um, droplets, like really? sneezing and coughing and stuff like that. Huh. That's Although horrible. some people think that, there's some people who think he may have had. Guillain-Barre rather than polio. I don't know what that is. Guillain-Barre is another type of disease. It's not related to polio. I don't know, I don't know a whole lot about it. It's not good. It's not good, clearly. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at the man. Yeah. Um, now, he actually got it while he was in Canada because his family <gasps> had a resort, had a like a retreat at Campobello Island from New Brunswick, which I knew not to trust those damn Canadians. Trudeau! <laughs> ah! New Brunswick. <laughs> is New Brunswick the part of Canada that remain part of no Britain. newfoundland was actually a british until like 1949 newfoundland was like separate from canada that's it's so i always thought that was weird in like hearts of iron like, four or whatever yeah newfoundland and labrador were an independent colony of britain mm-hmm. and then they united in 1949 i think became part of canada or something like that that's so strange 
so yeah. strange. Well, Prince Edward Island, what do you think? I mean, the maritime provinces of Canada are interesting. I don't know as much about them because it's mm-hmm. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, and kind of Newfoundland kind of falls into that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you have Quebec, which is its whole different thing. It's a whole different thing, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Plains of Abraham, you know. That's right. General Wolf. General Wolf. Getting, getting his wig split, you know. <laughs> Getting iced. Getting iced. Getting ghosted. <laughs> oh, uh. oh, boy. Oh, so mm-hmm. what do we have next? Uh, Truth, Justice, and the American Way is the next one. It's set in the 1932 election, and it has a very interesting divergence, as in Herbert Hoover wins re-election in 1932, which is very strange because there was almost, if anything could have been guaranteed in 1932, it's that FDR was going to win. Yeah. But in this, Al Smith runs on a third-party ticket and splits the Democratic vote, and Hoover wins somehow. Yeah. So, and then Hitler gets murdered by some of his own generals because he invades Czechoslovakia, and the U.S. fights this war with Japan, and the Soviet Union collapses, and the Nazis are still around in Germany. But the war with Japan is pretty indecisive. Like, yeah. The Japanese are still the kings of Asia. And then they're debating whether they're trying to get this guy Samuel Rosenman. They're trying to get him appointed an ambassador. But everyone is apparently anti-Semitic in the world, which in, makes no sense. In the whole, well, it's... Every major country is anti-Semitic because they're like, well, we could send them to Sweden. And it's like, ugh, why would you want to go there? Uh, complete backwater. Uh, he wants to go to a real country like uh, Japan. But Japan's still friends with Germany. So they don't want to alienate Germany by having this Jewish guy be their ambassador. Mm-hmm. And it's also explained that like Germany's, it's not completely controlled by the Nazis, but they're the, still the biggest, they're the party, majority yeah. party mm-hmm. at this point. Mm-hmm. You know... You really, Resnick, you're you're really playing with me here because I'm a big Hoover fan. I'm a Mm -hmm. big Hoover guy. And you tease me with this mention of, oh, what if Hoover won re-election? And then you snatch it away from me (laughs) to have a story that could be, the divergence doesn't matter at all. It has nothing to do with the story itself. Yeah. Which, (laughs) come on, man. Come on. Give me some give me some of that good (laughs) Hooverness. Give me some of that good Hoover. And then the next one is Kingfish, and that's set in 1936, and that's Huey Long becomes president. And Huey Long is a fascinating character. Absolutely fascinating. There's no one like him Not in really. the history of America, yeah. really. It's hard to imagine, yeah, someone quite like Huey Long. Someone who's a populist, but also almost sort of socialist kind of guy, but not anything at all yeah. like socialism. You know, the, the, the redistribution of wealth and yeah. like every man a king and like mm-hmm. all this stuff. And he came out of Louisiana, which had a very interesting, even then, political. And to this day, its politics are very strange. I mean, Louisiana is a very conservative state these days, but has a history of electing Democratic governors and politicians. And it's a very, mm. you know, in the New Orleans political scene is a fascinating one. It's just... But yeah, yeah, Huey Long. What a, what a wild mm-hmm. story. And he becomes president and Hitler ends up getting assassinated in the United States. Well, the way he becomes president is really funny because FDR's president at the time, John Nance Gardner, is his uh, VP, mm-hmm. and Huey courts Gardner. He's like, this FDR guy, he's on the way out. I'm on the way up. Mm-hmm. I almost got shot. I was going to wait for him to do two terms and then try to make a bid, but forget it. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm living in the moment now. YOLO. Let's make it happen. <laughs> so you're currently FDR's vice president, but you should run as my vice president at the same time. It'll be hilarious. Let's do it. <laughs> And it works out. They're able to split the vote bad enough. Uh, uh, Alf Landon, they call Alf Landon a joke in this short story, which I'm Alf Landon is no joke. He's no joke. That man's serious. Look in his eyes. Look. Look deeply I, into his eyes. Don't let that pretty face fool you, all right? That man's a killer. <laughs> um, hey, man, if he's the only one who can make it to 100. That's true, you know? So far. Yeah, yeah. So far, that's a good point. So Huey Long becomes president, and uh, he's president during the Depression, and he pr- makes all these promises of restoring prosperity and whatnot, but it, it, none of it really comes to fruition. There's still a lot of problems. Things are getting better, but very slowly. Mm-hmm. And uh, Huey Long gets this plan that he's going to get Hitler to come to the United States and uh, to, on a diplomatic journey, and he shows up. He goes to the Radio City Music Hall and takes pictures with rockets and all this <laughs> stuff. And at the end of the journey, he arranges for an assassin to shoot him, like right in front of John Nance Gardner. So like his head just explodes, <laughs> like right in front of the. Um, oh my goodness! Yeah, it's a, a crazy one. What an odd story. It was good though. I, I yeah. liked it. A little offbeat, yeah. I'll say this: spoilers, but uh, Joe Steele, that Turtle Dove book. 
speaking of heads exploding and Huey Long, in that story, um, Huey Long's like giving a speech. He's like, I'm not going to be intimidated by Joseph Steele. Oh, da, da. And in the middle of this speech, an assassin shoots him in the head and his head explodes. <laughs> Jeez. In the exact same way, yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the next is No Other Choice, which is set in the 1944 after the 44 election and Thomas Dewey becomes president which isn't explained again it's pretty hard to see how he would have won in 44 seriously and the war seems to be going on the same path which is which makes it hard to believe because that's believable if the US was doing really badly in the war but it's pretty hard to see the United States switching over to a different party different president right don't swap horses in the middle of a stream that's what Lincoln was saying in 1864 right exactly yeah don't don't step on superman's cape that's right. And you don't mess around with Jim. <laughs> yeah, no, <Okay>. but <laughs> no. And then, um, uh, so Dewey wins and they're going to use, they want to think about how to use the atom bomb. He doesn't want to drop it on a city. So he wants to drop it on a test site to show the Japanese how powerful it is. So maybe they'll surrender, but they do it, but the Japanese won't surrender. Yeah. So then they're like, Oh, we have to nuke Tokyo. And as opposed to Nagasaki, or Hiroshima, mm -hmm. which are much smaller cities than Tokyo. They talk about how estimates would be 8 million people would die. Mm -hmm. Dewey's like, oh my God, if we invade, estimates are a million Americans will die. But to keep that from happening, I have to kill 8 million Japanese. What a horrible decision. Mm -hmm. And at the end, he ends up going with the nuking. Mm -hmm. And then it just ends. But the interesting thing is, is that they want to bring the war to an end, but it actually may have prolonged it if they did that hmm. because if you kill the the emperor and any member of the cabinet who's for peace then you know you have the military taking over <laughs> and they're not going to stop fighting no matter what no, basically. they tried they tried to overthrow the emperor yeah the emperor made that recording that mm -hmm. vinyl record recording that he sent off to the radio stations to go play to the japanese people just telling them to lay down their arms and that they're surrendered and to stop fighting and they tried to stop him. They tried to intercept this thing yeah. from happening. One of his chamberlains managed to hide it somewhere, like in a sealed basement, hmm. like while they were like searching the palace for it. I mean, it's actually much more of a closely run thing. I'm shocked they haven't done like a movie about it here. Yeah, it'd be well, actually pretty. It'd be a little controversial, though. I think with Japanese people. Yeah. Let's see what's next. Ah, the more things changed. Thomas Dewey's back. So I was excited because I'm like, yes, more Dewey. Yes, fantastic. We demand more Dewey, Max. You got to do the do. Do the do. Um. Uh, <laughs> but in this one, the front page, the front cover of this book has Thomas Dewey holding up a headline that says, Truman defeats Dewey. Yeah. <laughs> so I was expecting this story to be very fleshed out and have a lot of detail to it. And it doesn't really. It's six pages long. It's maybe the shortest short story in the entire collection. Mm-hmm. And all there is to it is that, like, and it, so what Dewey does is that he focuses on uh, anti-communist rhetoric during his campaign. So he uh, focuses on Alger Hiss and focuses on alleged communists. He uses uh, Joseph McCarthy. The Rosenberg thing goes public right before the election, and he ends up winning because of that. And as a result, you get the classic parallelism thing where the newspaper is just reversed, and he's like, ah, oh, Truman defeats Dewey. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and that brings me on to a topic that of these books. These are good books. There's alternate presidents, alternate Kennedys, alternate generals, alternate uh, warriors, alternate outlaws. But one thing they stand out is they have some of the best book covers you will ever see. They're so good. Yeah, this one has, you know, this one has on the front, ha ha, Truman defeats Dewey with Dewey doing that. But the best one is alternate warriors, in my yes. opinion. Yes. Absolutely. It's this muscled up Gandhi with this like going, eh, and he's got an RPG in his hand and you see like a <laughs> nuclear blast going off behind him. <laughs> and he's got a bandolier bullets across his chest. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's it's probably the best book cover I've ever seen. Uh, alternate Kennedys has the whole Kennedy family on a record album. Yeah. <laughs> as if they're like a pop group or something. <laughs> Even Joseph P. Kennedy is on yeah, there Joe as well. Yeah, Joe Sr. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Or yeah. uh, alternate uh, outlaws, with right. Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley on the front, yeah. And then alternate uh, ty alternate tyrants, where it's uh, Douglas MacArthur wearing a kimono <laughs> <laughs> on the front, and like the, with the sunglasses and the corn cob pipe. <laughs> oh yeah, that's it, awesome. Emperor MacArthur. Emperor, ah, uh, the Shogun himself. Um, I'm trying to think what other good ones there are. Uh, alternate Generals 3 has Lee and Grant. But they're wearing Roman uniforms. I think one of them's supposed to be like Hannibal and the other one's yeah. supposed to be there's Scipio George, Africanus or yeah, something. Yeah, there's one. Alternate Generals 2 has 
has George Washington on the front, but he's in an American World War II general's <laughs> uniform, which makes not a whole lot of sense. <laughs> but hey, it's a striking cover. Those people do their job, which is they have a striking cover, right. which frankly, half the people, that's why they're going to pick up the book. It's like, look at this. <sighs> Alternate Generals 1 is a... Roman like a, centurion in a, in like a panzer. Yeah. And the back of it's like very deceptive because it's like, what if George Patton was at bull run? It's like, well, that's not actually the way most of the stories are. Sorry guys. Speaking of Romans in uh, German tanks, wasn't there a, uh, a steel Panther scenario or whatever? Oh, with the Romans? Goodness. Yeah. So there was an, exp- I used to play this game, steel Panthers. I'm sure I mentioned it before. And it had various, like people would create their own scenarios and you could find these like add-on packs. And one of them was like for one of the Steel Panthers, I think it was World at War, or one of the newer ones. And it was like for modern era. And they had like these scenarios that were like set in Egypt, but you were like the Roman army and like the Roman empire survives into modern day. And you have to fight these battles. There's this one where you have challenger tanks and you're fighting against this local dictator or warlord who has T-34s, <laughs> Joseph Stalin's, T-72s, SU-100s. <laughs> And it's just like, what the? <laughs> what world does this exist? Yeah, and it's, but it's the 1970s. But like the <laughs> Soviet Union, the United States, Great Britain, and France all exist. But like the Roman Empire does. It didn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's pretty fun. Huh. But still, Panthers. Yeah, there's some good alternate scenarios. There's one in the first one where it was Japan invading San Francisco in it huh. and like you have to repel it as the American you can play as both either side but like the Americans like you literally will have like infantry squads and you'll click on them and it'll say like San Francisco police <laughs> you know stuff like that like local civilians you know <laughs> there's another one where they had one where it was the invasion of Japan in 45 and another one is fighting outside of Tokyo in 46 I remember huh. it's called on the Kanto plane and you have Pershings and Chaffees and Shermans and you're fighting against like the Japanese and it's really good. Do you have one of those double treaded tank destroyer things? No, those didn't come into use. No, but like you have to, it's really, it's a really, that was a really tough one because there's mines everywhere. And in the game, usually if you fight an infantry squad and like kill of enough of the enemy, like they'll retreat, but the Japanese ones won't. You have to kill all of them because huh. they're like suicide fighting units. Right. So it was really, really interesting. Do they have like the, the, like the people with sticks and stuff? Like, yeah <laughs> yeah pretty much huh. yeah um bamboo sticks you have uh also had um one where it was japan and germany win and there's like a meeting engagement between them fighting in india and they have <laughs> panthers that have 88 millimeters on them so it's like what <laughs> how'd that happen okay well, that's alternate history for you yeah that was fun there's a great game series called panzer general also Allied General and a bunch of other ones like that. And um, in the first Panzer General, it was like for DOS or whatever. It's one of those hex games, kind of like Steel Panthers, but mm-hmm. larger. You have like mm-hmm. airplane. It's like more operational level. Yeah. And uh, depending on how well you do in the missions, the course of World War II will change. So it's like this, you you have the same units and the same people through mission to mission. Mm-hmm. Like if you're Nazi Germany, if you do well enough, you like invade South Carolina and like <laughs> attack Oak Ridge to get the nuclear weapon there. What? I know, it's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, oh, geez. The In Pacific General, you can play as the Japanese and you eventually you go to India and do all sorts of stuff there. And then mm-hmm. you similarly, you attack California at the end of it. And it's <laughs> it's, it's very fun. Very cool. Goodness. Oh, boy. And that's where we got from Dewey Defeats German. (laughs) Dewey Defeats German. Fantastic. (laughs) Um, So then the next one is the impeachment of Adlai Stevenson. It's a really interesting hmm. one. Adlai Stevenson wins in 1952, the election, because Eisenhower picks McCarthy as his running mate, which is not a very good thing. Tailgunner Joe. Tailgunner Joe. Hmm. Too smart for his own good. Too smart. Maybe. Uh, Adlai. But in this one, the 50s are not the 50s. He spares the Rosenbergs. He won't back France and into China. He sends troops to help Batista in Cuba, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm. He fires J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah. All that sort of crazy stuff. So basically, like, he's about to resign because, and this is after the 56 election, because people just hate him. Yeah, yeah. And the guy who is like the POV character is just, I wanted to help him out. But, you know, I don't want to go work for Richard Nixon. That seems like a good guy. <laughs> I can't tell exactly who this guy is supposed to be. There's obviously a lot of cheeky mm-hmm. little references to things mm-hmm. like blood in the water. I should use that in one of my speeches in the future. Don't know what the hell he's talking about. But um, since he goes to work for Richard Nixon and because he's writing the resignation sp- speech for Adlai Stevenson, I'm thinking this guy is Ray Price, who's the guy who wrote Richard Nixon's real resignation mm-hmm. speech. Although... 
It could be Ben Stein. <laughs> well, Ben Stein was a speechwriter for Nixon, but I think he would have been too young to have been working in the 50s. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, but he did have money, which you could win. Yeah. Win Ben Stein's money. You could win Ben Stein's money. Yeah. I, it's hard to believe that he was actually worked in the Nixon White House, but he did. And, and he's still around. Yes. Hey, speaking of working in the Nixon White House, you know who else is still around? Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger. 95 years old. There's a picture of him sitting with this president, the current president right yeah. now. You can watch interviews with him like on YouTube. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. He's still mm-hmm. going. Adlai Stevenson, not still going. Yeah, though. not still going. He's been dead a while. He died in the 60s. But he, um, he was an interesting character because some people said he was too smart to be president. Too smart. Yeah. I'm sure it was not actually because he was too smart. <laughs> yeah, well, that was not the right time for the 50s. Was not a time I think America was really ready for. Adlai Stevenson was a very is a very unique character, kind of in American politics. His grandfather is actually vice president. Adlai Stevenson was one of Grover Cleveland's vice presidents. Really? Mm-hmm. So he's actually Adlai Stevenson Jr. I think he's the third. Interesting. Something like that. It's just like Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was an interesting one. And then there's some various ones that are set in the, the 60s. Yeah, there's heavy metal, which is something about the mayor of Chicago and JFK butt heads with one another. So Not shockingly. <laughs> yeah, that for that reason, JFK doesn't become president mm-hmm. and Richard Nixon becomes president and, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we, there's one where Barry Goldwater becomes president. Yeah, and uses nuclear mm-hmm. weapons because... That's Barry Goldwater. Because that's Barry Goldwater. Probably not in reality, though. I doubt that he yeah, would actually yeah. do that. But he was the, his impression that he gave off in 64 was he was a hawk. That uh, that ad that I the think Daisy. it's Daisy, is, that is really messed up. <laughs> that is a terrible thing. It's an act of political genius. Lyndon Johnson is? That that ad. I mean, oh, was, that ad is, yeah. Lyndon Johnson was something else. He was a he he gave people the Johnson treatment. I'll oh, tell you yeah. That. Have you ever seen a picture of him like like talking to some guy? It's like, wow. <laughs> That's a me too moment right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. <laughs> look at look up picture of, of Lyndon Johnson, the Johnson treatment. And he literally is like because he used he was quite a large man. Yes. Like physically. He was he was pretty <laughs> tall. Mm. And quite broad. He was a heavily built guy. Mm-hmm. And like him just like talking over people like, ha, 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 ha. And he's like he's laughing and he's yeah. like literally like cowing over that. It's crazy. There, there's uh, also phone conversations of him, like messages he's left on people's answering machines that are just ridiculous. Are they? Yeah. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> this man was president. <laughs> yeah. Like with, to press conferences, he'd like show people like, oh, I had my gallbladder surgery here. Or he'd take um, – he'd take <laughs> – journalists who come and visit him on his ranch in texas he he would like be drinking whiskey out of like a dixie cup and be driving them at like 90 miles an hour in his car just just (laughs) just a little crazy crazy (laughs) linden what are you doing well um but he's a really fascinating i mean because in one hand like he was this uncouth southerner but he did a whole lot for civil rights and other stuff but just also but also crazy yeah the uh, war on poverty or whatever. War on drugs was Richard Nixon. War, yeah. And mm-hmm. then the war on terror. And the then... war on terror. The war on good taste was Jim Carter. Oh. <laughs> that flannel he's wearing? <laughs> what is up with that? <laughs> Gross. But what about the war on rabbits also by him? Rabbits? Yeah. Haven't you seen that uh, famous picture of a rabbit swimming out to his canoe and he's like, ah, oh, he's trying to hit it with a paddle. <laughs> no. Go away. Yeah. No. <laughs> that was a famous thing back really? then. Really? Yeah. What about Billy Carter? He, he Billy had, Beer. He loved beer. I'll tell you that much. He also it. loved taking money from the Libyan government. Uh, really? That's what happened. Like Libby, Billy Carter took money from the Libyan government. Yeah. Muammar Gaddafi? I guess, of course, it's Muammar Gaddafi. Yeah. Who else? Yeah, exactly. Who else? The colonel himself. He also gave money. What a, what, a, what a humble man. He never raised himself above the rank of colonel. Yeah. You know, the guy's really down to earth. and like <laughs> Now he is definitely down to earth. Oh, no. Very down to earth. Oh. <laughs> oh, damn, son. Um, Momar. He also gave money to the Symbionese Liberation Army. Really? Did he? Yeah. That doesn't shock me. And Lockerbie. Don't forget about yeah. Lockerbie. And he did love Condoleezza Rice. He did. Condi. My Condi. Oh, <laughs> beautiful Condi. <laughs> what a crazy... They don't, they don't make people like that anymore. Um, yeah. No more of those Cold War era dictators. 
Uh, There's a few. Bashir al-Assad, is he Cold War? No, 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 he's not. Because his dad, Hafez, was in power until, I think, 2000. Okay, that's true. That's true. Oh, the guy who was ahead of, like... um, like Equatorial Guinea, I think, have been there. There's some guy who's been the president of some country from like the 70s. Wow. Oof. Was he on the American side of all this? Yeah, or? sort of, I think. Mm. Is it? Who was it? It'll come to me eventually. Fidel was still in charge Fidel. until relatively recent. Or something yeah. Like that. yeah. Fidel. Mm. Oh, that's right. He, Raul took over, but he was still alive. Right. Until, he died yeah. not that long ago, a couple of years ago. Yeah. This is an anti-Fidel podcast. Oh, that's right. <laughs> no it's, peace with Cuba. It's pro Raul. Pro Raul. Yes, pro yes. Raul. Pro. Um, it's anti Hugo Chavez, but pro Maduro. <laughs> Love Maduro. He's so good at what You're he's about doing. The only people on the face of the earth who would say that. Yeah. Especially not in not in Venezuela. Yeah. Ugh. But but that bird told him that. Uh, the bird, the bird told him. The bird, the bird came to me, and I knew it was Ugo. I knew it was him, and he was telling me I was doing a great job. Yeah, well. So shame on you. Yeah. And also, I'm going to have this press conference, and I'm going to have this picture of Simone Bolivar right here. Huh? All right? Simone uh, Bolivar, me, basically uh, the same guy. Yeah, basically you know? the same guy, only separated by time. Only separated by time. We're basically the exact same person. Yeah, so. basically. You should dress up as Simone Bolivar. That'd be pretty funny. <laughs> The epaulets and the <laughs> yeah. put on some false uh, uh, mutton chops. Mutton chops and that really long collar, yeah. like that long, <laughs> stiff collar. Perfect. That's or, what Venezuela needs. All these medals, uh, just yeah. just appropriate all of them. See, that's what I. I'm, there's no more regimes these days, other than like about North Korea, that give people lots of medals for no reason. You know, it is. Um, I, I I do kind. Of, uh, Maybe they still give heads of states like medals and whatnot. But I know, really like, hear about like the it. Queen of England makes lots of like monarchs, um, you know, uh, members of the Order of the Bath. Like the Emperor is a member of the Order of the Bath, the Order, Order of the Garter. Order, Order of the Garter, yeah. Because like, what was it? There was like a dance, and somebody dropped their garter, and he picked it up and was like, "Here you go, madam." I, I don't know. And then decided to make. I've an been order to their headquarters it. at Windsor Windsor uh, Castle. Really, the Order of the Garter, yeah. Mm-hmm. What's it like there? At Windsor Castle? Yeah. It's like a big castle. It's got some pretty cool stuff. They have like they had some stuff that British soldiers had like looted from India in the eighteen hundreds. And one really? of them was like a tiger statue like plated in gold that had like jewels for eyes. It was really interesting. They stole it from some Was it the Tipu Sultan? It may have been Tipu the, Sultan. The Tiger of Mysore, aka? Perhaps, yes. Buddy of Napoleon. That's right. Brother from another mother. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. No, um, but they have some cool stuff there, and they have... It's an interesting palace, actually, to go to. It's got some cool, cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And the queen was there when we were there. Really? I mean, we didn't see her, but they had the flag flying over it that signifies, like, oh, she's nice. in residence there. So they have a bedroom for her or whatever? Well, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> You're welcome at Windsor yeah. Castle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, no, it was a... Uh, what the hell were we talking about? <laughs> But yeah, I think we'll just jump ahead a little bit mm-hmm. to, I think, the crown jewel yes. of all of these. Crown. It's the final story in this compilation. It's called Dukakis and the Aliens. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, Max, we should be more respectful. Iron Mike Dukakis is one of the most important people of the last uh, 30 years, I'd say. I got to tell you, you know what? I might have told you this at some point, but my grandfather knows Dukakis. Yeah, I think you mentioned it once. Present tense knows Dukakis. That's like, awesome. Dukakis sent him a fruit basket this year. <laughs> oh, wow. Not kidding. Iron Mike. Iron we Mike. love you. The duel of the Iron Mike. <laughs> um, apparently, he's a very nice man. I'm sure he is. He seems like a very nice man. Mm. He just, there's just, he made some missteps in 1988. Yeah. That that tank man. That tank man. Although I have been in a tank in a somewhat similar position, wearing mm. a helmet like that. And I also did look ridiculous. Yeah. I'm not as short as Michael Dukakis either. Well, didn't um, gosh, oh man, the uh, Margaret Thatcher wasn't she in a tank too? Yeah, but th- she pulled it off. She, she pulled just it looked off. like, yay, yeah. <laughs> like you're at a go kart at Adventure <laughs> Landing or something, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yay. Uh, who's the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party? What's it? Ruth uh, Ruth Davies? Or no, something? no, of the Scottish Conservatives. Oh, uh, Ruth, is it Davidson? Uh, there's a great picture of Ruth Davidson sitting on, I don't think it's technically a tank. I think it's self-propelled artillery. Yeah. It's like a paladin or yeah, whatever. Yeah, paladin. 
but she's she's sitting on it rather suggestively. I'll just say uh, <laughs> it's like right right between the legs there. Um, <laughs> she's funny. I like her. Yeah, she likes to troll the SNP. Oh, which is pretty easy to it's do. It's pretty easy. <laughs> Poor Salmon. Uh, they they hey man they rolled the dice and they lost and they lost. Well, they ro- they won and then they proceeded to lose yeah. several times in yeah. their leadership, which is why they're not in charge anymore. Yeah, well they did really well in one election and and then they they lost some ground. Hmm. It's a fascinating party. Yeah, yeah. I was watching the last general election that happened with Theresa May and mm-hmm. I saw uh Davidson like speak during it. It was mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. I was well, she was one of the people who led the the, the stake the the remain campaign in 2014. Yeah, yeah. Or the and for Scotland remaining for Scotland. In the, not yeah. the the other remain campaign. I remember watching that. Today is is Independence Day. Is Independence Day aka uh the day that our channel was founded back in 2006. That's right. June 23rd. That's right. Which is going to reveal how long it takes to edit these episodes <laughs> when so, I finally uh, post it. Uh, um, no, uh, but, um, yeah, but it's also the second anniversary of Brexit. Oh, uh, is it? Mm-hmm. Interesting. It is? Interesting. I did that on purpose, you know. Yes. I it was all culmi- culminating with this day. With this day, yeah. This we, day of days, you could even say. We, de- we declare their ind- our independence That's right. from... Gibraltar will never be part of the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> Holy British soil. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, oh, my goodness. But yeah, Dukakis and the aliens. We've totally forgotten. Michael Dukakis becomes president, and then he finds out there's aliens, and then they blow him up. Yeah. Well, for, well, he goes to Area 51, and he's playing coy with these guys. He's like, what? Aliens? What's going on here? It, there's a twist at the end of this story. But anyway, it's kind of like in the Harry Potter books. I, I, I think it might be uh, Goblet of Fire. It might be Goblet of Fire, because at the very beginning of it, they talk to the British Prime Minister. Like a bunch of wizards show up at the prime minister's office and explain what magic is to him. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what's going on? Oh, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like that, but aliens in Michael Dukakis in this aliens. story. Yeah. But it's revealed that he's actually an alien in disguise himself. Hmm. He's a reptilian. I don't know if I believe Michael Dukakis is an alien. I definitely believe Walter Mondale's an alien. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm just kidding, just... I mean, the other, Walter Mondale's still alive too. He is still alive. And so is Michael Dukakis. Michael Dukakis is still alive. What about McGovern's dead? He, But he didn't die that long ago. He was in his 90s when he died. Hmm. Um, Gerald Ford's dead. Well, Bob Dole was the vice presidential candidate in 76, and he's still alive. That's right. He was involved in uh, a, a Taiwan thing recently. He was the one who set up the phone call between ah, the... He's uh, like 95 or 96. Huh. He's pretty old. False arm, right? Well, his, no, his, he lost the use of his second arm. Or second arm. His second arm? <laughs> his second arm. He lost the use of his right arm. What about his third arm? <laughs> he was in a Viagra commercial, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think he was. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. No. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> um, no. Um, Robert, Bob Dole. Okay. Robert Dole. Dole. Bobby Dole. Bobby. Bobby. Bobby's Rob, world. Rob Dole. Um, <laughs> no, Bob Dole actually lost the use of his right arm. In the Second World War, in April of 1945, he was a member of the 10th Mountain Division, mm-hmm. and it was he was injured by shrapnel or machine gun fire serving in Italy during the Po Valley Campaign in 45, wow, which is really cool. interesting, because another later-to-be-influential senator, Daniel Inouye, was in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the famous Nisei unit, also in Italy at that time, a little bit farther away, more toward the West Coast, who lost his right arm to a grenade. And an action that he later was awarded the Medal of Honor for when he was a senator. Huh. He also died a little while ago, a few years ago. So if Bob Dole had... Both be- became senators, but both served fighting in Italy in 45, which is a backwater. <laughs> but they both, you know... Like, what a what a, what an interesting coincidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if Bob Dole had become president, would that be the last time a combat veteran was president? If he'd won in 96? Yeah. No, uh, he would have been. That was the last time a World War II veteran ran for president. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um. Well, if John Kerry had won, no, no. Well, John Kerry was a combat veteran in Vietnam. Yes. He served in a, a swift swift boat. Yes. <laughs> John McCain was a combat veteran. He flew combat missions over Vietnam before he was shot down. 
Romney and Obama were not. W was part of the. Uh, he was the Air National, National Guard, Guard, but not combat veteran. His George, well, George H. W. Bush, who just turned ninety four, not that long ago, it was a combat veteran of the Second World War. He was a. He was a through a. He flew a Avenger. Really, a torpedo bomber. Yeah, so he was shot down in forty four, but yeah, he was rescued by a submarine. Yeah, he's a combat veteran in the Pacific. John F. Kennedy was a combat veteran. Um, there's actually, it's interesting. So if you start out, so the first president who was a veteran technically of the second world war is Eisenhower in 53, but you know, in the, the broadest <laughs> sense, yes, technically a veteran, but it's just like how Grant was the first civil war veteran to be a president of the United States. Yes, true. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Eisenhower army, but then after Eisenhower, it's all Navy guys hmm. because Kennedy, no, that's not true. Cause Truman, well, no, 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 but Truman, Truman was, was a World War I veteran. War, well, yeah, that's true. But he was not a World War II he, veteran. Yeah, okay. Because Kennedy was a Navy veteran, combat veteran, PT-109. Johnson was a Navy veteran who came close to combat a few times, but he, he was a first member of Congress at, during the Second World War to join the military. He, joined, he was in the Naval Reserve, so he was a Naval officer. Richard Nixon was a Naval officer, non-combat Nixon. Ford was in the Navy as well, another naval officer, but not a combat veteran. Carter was in the Naval Academy during the Second World War. I don't know if he counts as a as a veteran or not. In some ways, he probably does count. I don't know how he sees it, how whether he defines himself as a combat veteran. But he sir, he's not certainly a combat veteran. But he's he's old enough to be a World War II veteran. He's still alive, so we can ask him. You know, get on Twitter and he probably hey. could. Um, and then Reagan was. An army veteran. He was, but he made movies stateside because right, his yeah. actually his vision was really bad. Um, and then Reagan, George H. Then George H. W. Bush. Yeah, Clinton was not a veteran. Not right. a veteran of the military. <laughs> veteran of the drug war. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> smoked. I but I did not inhale. <laughs> That's a masterpiece, uh, master class. Oh my goodness. Uh, uh, Donald Trump went to military school, didn't he? Yeah, but not in the military. Well, not in the military, but that's closer than Obama. You know, I guess so. Yeah. I guess, yeah. Romney was not in the military. No, no. Um, neither was John Edwards. And yeah. neither, Al Gore was actually a veteran of Vietnam. Al He's, Gore served in the military. I'm very surprised. He was actually based in Vietnam. He, I don't know if he was combat. I think there was maybe even some questions. He, I think he was, he was assigned to like an engineer battalion or something. But he was in Vietnam in 71, which is interesting because night Vietnam in 71, the U.S. is scaling back. I mean, there still were combat units there, but... You know, mm-hmm. Vietnamization was in full swing by 71. Um, uh, 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 Democratic presidential nominee Jim Webb. Yes, uh, yeah, combat veteran. Yeah. Combat veteran and also wrote the script for the film Terms of Engagement hmm. with Samuel L. Jackson. Oh, yeah. Waste them. Shoot all of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, what a film. <laughs> what, yeah, what a film. Al Gore. That's interesting because Tommy Lee Jones is in the movie Terms of Engagement. Mm hmm. Tommy Lee Jones was Al Gore's roommate at Harvard. Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. You know who was Michael Dukakis's roommate? My grandpa. Really? Yeah, really. Not kidding. That's wow. 100% true. Hmm. Yeah. That's why, you know, Fruit Basket, you know what I'm Oh, saying. that makes sense. Yeah. So they're still friends. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Mike. That was a uh, 88. He did win West Virginia, though. He actually won some states. Dukakis did better than Mondale. Mondale got creamed by Reagan. Yeah. Mondale won Washington, D.C. in Minnesota and barely won Minnesota. (laughs) Uh, Is D.C. one electoral vote? Just one? It's three? Three. Oh, because that's the minimum, right? Because it's the minimum. Because each state is going to have at least three electoral votes because they'll have at least one representative. It would always be be weird to live in a state that had more senators than representatives. Mm. But wait, the rep- but the representatives from D.C. don't do anything, right? They No, they have, I think they're like non-vote. They're non-voting in the sense of like they can't, or maybe they do, I don't, I can't remember. Isn't it like Puerto Rico? Like they can Well, Puerto advise. Rico, they can, they can elect people and they can show up and they cast like a symbolic vote. But, a symbolic vote? Well, like but what? Puerto Rico has a lot of, it's interesting stuff. I mean, we're not talking about the hurricane stuff, but just like they, Puerto Rico is in an interesting position because Puerto Ricans are American citizens. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't pay income tax but they do pay social security taxes is that right Mm -hmm. and it's a commonwealth so it's technically associated with the united states but it is u.s territory we're responsible for their their foreign relations it is part of the united states well they don't pay income tax at all no i don't think so but they do pay social security tax why aren't more businesses in puerto rico there are a lot of businesses okay most tranquilizers used in the united states are made in puerto rico is that right maybe not now but they used to be Bacardi, isn't that a Puerto Rican company? No, I think Bacardi is actually Bermudan. Bermudan. 
It's not American? I don't think so. Ugh. Ugh. I don't know. Ugh. But what about the Vir- American Virgin Islands? You know who was born in the American U.S. Virgin Islands? I don't know. Fraser Crane himself. <gasps> Kelsey Grammer was born you in the Virgin Islands. You've got to be kidding me. I am not kidding you. That's Look amazing. It up. Yeah. That's amazing. You know who was born in the Bahamas? Who? Sidney Poitier. No, he wasn't. He was born in Miami. Oh, uh, no. He's you're a Bahamian. Right. He's a Bahamian, but born in the United States, which means he was a U.S. citizen by birth. Uh, He's also a veteran of the Second World War. Really? Mm-hmm. Wait, let me guess the Navy. Army. Army. Mm-hmm. Okay. Where? Uh, uh, somewhere in uh, stateside, not not combat. Oh, okay. All right. I'm trying to think That's of fine. notable people who were combat veterans. There's not a whole lot left alive. Um, Charles Durning, who was an actor, not a very famous one. He was a he was a combat veteran mm-hmm. for sure. Lee Marvin, combat veteran, Marine, Saipan. Interesting. Yeah, shot in the butt at Saipan. Oh, mm-hmm. my great 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 grandfather was shot in the butt at Antietam, and then he was shot in his left arm at Gettysburg. Where, where his arm was then amputated. Ow. And then was no longer a soldier at that point. Yeah, that usually, usually that happens. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But survived. Oh, well. Good for him. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did I say Antietam? I mean Sharpsburg. <laughs> oh, yeah. Excuse Please. us. Sharpsburg. That's right. We should name all our battles. Yeah. Well, that, the Union did named battles after the nearest body of water, named their armies after the nearest body of water, the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the Tennessee, the Army of the Mississippi, really? where the Confederates Army of Tennessee, because they're the state Army of Northern Virginia, okay. which made Southern Virginians very, very angry. And Western Virginians don't even care what they think. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Well, it became West Virginia, so... Did you know that the new Fallout game is taking place in West Virginia? Hmm. Of all places. I've been there. It's very nice. Have you? The Shenandoah Valley. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful place. Beautiful place. Country roads take me home, right? Exactly, exactly. John Denver. That's a famous... That's a very popular song in China, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. It's very relatable, hmm. you know? Is it? Everyone can relate to that. Country roads take me home, you know... West Virginia and Mount West Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Shenandoah Valley. Yeah, yeah, Shenandoah Valley, yes. <laughs> Everyone knows that. <laughs> it is a good song, though. It's um, a fine song. A fine song. And what has this have to anything to do with Michael Dukakis being an alien? Um, Absolutely nothing. So they vaporize Michael Dukakis at the end of the story because uh, he's revealed to be a reptilian. And not just his electoral results. Oh. <sighs> Yeah. Ooh, well, actually, burn. at uh, the end of the story, what they do is that they contact the authority, which is controlling all the timelines. And they're like, oh, man, we really screwed this one up. Could you please wind back the clock and make H.W. the president? And that's what ends up happening. They're like, oh, no, but the, the Gulf War is going to happen. Oh, we're just going to have to do it anyway. <laughs> Michael Dukakis fighting the Gulf War. That would be a fun one. Himself in his tank. That's right. Look, I don't want to. I'm, leading, I'm leading the charge myself. Look, Michael, I don't want to make fun of you. Okay, I, I really do. You seem like a really nice guy, so I don't want to rag on you too hard. Okay. I don't know if he's listening, but if he is, look, Michael, awesome. I, I know you're a big fan of our show. It's fine. Look, you don't have to make a comment or anything, <laughs> or mention it in a tweet or anything. That's fine. That's fine. You don't have to do that, but it would really help, Michael. <laughs> Mike, please. Iron Mike. <laughs> He's an interesting character, but he did win more electoral votes, Massachusetts, yeah. West Virginia. He won more than friggin' Alf Landon, you know. Look, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to rag on Alf Landon or anything. He's a nice guy. He's a he good was friend a nice of mine. Guy. Yeah, he was a nice guy. We were like best friends. Yeah, yeah. He died before I was born, and you too. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hmm. That busts that whole thing about how we said we were cursed veterans in the other oh, one. Oh, no, no, I forgot. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, actually, we're older than Michael. Did. We're out older than <laughs> Alfland. No, probably not. Even no, then. no. The Al- oldest living person in the world is currently alive today is born in 1901, I believe. Okay. Okay. No one left who was born in the 19th century. 19th century, exactly. Only the 20th. Only the 20th. There's people born in the 21st century who are talking and using the internet. Some of them are legal adults. Some of them make- if they were born before June of 2000, they are legal adults. Some of them are making YouTube comments right now. They can be executed. They can legally. be executed. They can sign a contract. They can sign a contract. You know? They can be sued. They can be in prison. They can be in more. prison. I mean, you can be in prison before. It, yeah, but there's not as much. It's yeah. Easier. Well, you know, you really got to. You really got to get you, angry. Yeah, you got to do some, do some dirt. Yeah, do some damage, yeah. Yeah. 
wrongfully accused though um all of them everyone wrongfully no one did anything no one did wrongfully accused starring liam neeson is that a movie yeah it's bad <laughs> it looks it's bad. not good it's it's making fun of the fugitive no oh. look naked gun is a classic that movie's amazing naked gun 2 still really funny and naked gun 33 and it, seven eights or whatever I, it's it not horrible but it's okay but which is the one that has uh, <laughs> uh what's his name oj in it oj that's the first one i think the first one i think he might he might be in the second the but juice. i don't think so i remember in that one he's like putting all these things on his gun and eventually he has a big anti-aircraft gun <laughs> a bofors the bofors yeah, yeah. Bofors. fantastic boom 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 uh, 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 twin okay. linked isn't that what they call that what? twin linked yeah i don't like know two. if it's twin linked but maybe yeah twin vickers as twin that vickers. guy in archer says we need twin vickers and a lewis gun mustard gas yeah, mustard gas zeppelins, zeppelins. <laughs> <laughs> jinx huh. oh, that's the one where they have the <laughs> the death bet right where it's like the last person alive gets the pool yeah something like that yeah a pool of money not, that's right yeah and, and that's pool. what woodhouse is Woodhouse is, talks about his past, and he was like an opium den at one point. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, Percy! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> he died out in no man's land because of him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like that there's World War One veterans in Archer. It makes you wonder when this actually takes place. Well, I don't think it. It's kind of timeless. Although hey, World War One veterans were living until the 2010s. Yeah, that's true. A few. That's true. Um, Could you imagine that? It's like, I was serving in 1918, and it's 2010, and I'm still alive. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's Damn. I'm here going to this uh, to the Zaxby's, and uh, <laughs> I'm, lis- I, I'm ordering a salad. I'm listening to uh, to LMFAO on, on the radio. <laughs> and, and I was in the trenches. I was in the <laughs> trenches. It's like- well, actually, the last veteran of the trenches died, I think, in 2009. I think it was Harry Patch, if I recall correctly. Who is this? He was a British soldier. He served okay. at Passchendaele. Passchendaele. They made a movie about that. They did. It's got a good... There's a end fighting scene that's pretty crazy. Hmm. It's a Canadian movie, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they're Canadians. Yeah. They're the uh, Little Black Devils, is Look, what they're called. I gotta tell they're you... Even, from Manitoba, or Saskatchewan, I think. Can- Canadians are... Some of the finest soldiers the British Empire ever produced. Absolutely, yes. Like, people, people make fun of Canadians, for, and it's bad. They shouldn't do it, because Canada's got a lot to be proud of i'll just say the flying aces you know yeah billy bishop although there was a big question about whether he shot down as many planes as he claimed but even if he didn't shoot down the that great, many he'd still be i an mean ace, the true right? great allied ace of the sec the first world war i would say is either renee Fonk of okay. france but even more my favorite is actually james mccutton james i don't know james byford is. thomas mccutton he was at one point was a leading allied pilot he died in a plane crash in 1918 what was remarkable about him is that if you read a book, I got my hands on this, and this shows you how much of a nerd I am, but it's called Above the Trenches, and it actually breaks down every British ace, and it talks about their vict- like each of their individual victories. Like It has lists, and it shows, like they compile data on like the dates it happened, what planes they were flying at the time. Whether- and then one of the things is the designation was the plane destroyed, destroyed in flames, out of control, or captured, which means it was shot down behind British lines. And most German planes did not stray over British lines, but... Other than reconnaissance planes. Mm -hmm. And and his, like the number, like most British, they've tried some some breakdowns and like most pilots of the time, most of their victories, at least allied pilots could not, a lot of them only small fractions, maybe a third or a half, usually less, maybe a third at best for most of them could actually be confirmed by German records. And it was something like for McCudden, like close to half of his, they could directly link to German records, Hmm. which is pretty crazy, which means he was damn good at what he did. Shot down a lot of reconnaissance planes behind allied lines which was not very like sexy work but very important very important but you know you know it's not like the dueling with the red baron sort of thing Mm -hmm. like that but most of the red baron's victories are actually confirmed by allied records which is pretty crazy because most of them were shot down behind german lines and stuff like that so they could actually pull like the i won't say called the vin number but like the airplane number and so like i think it's like well over 90 percent of them can be linked in some way or other to him he was shot down by australians right yeah, most likely on the ground, yeah. Australian gunners on the ground is most likely. And there's a couple different documentaries about who they think. But it's probably not Roy Brown, the guy who was credited with shooting him down. Hmm. Probably was not the guy who shot him down. The Australian ground gunners. I'm not sure what, but someone got him. Tell me about Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell, the great 
uh, advocate of air power. He was one of the, the leading American aviators in World War I in the sense of like generals commanding. But he picked a fight after the war with the basically saying, like, we need to develop air power more. And people didn't want to listen to him. He ruffled some feathers and he was court-martialed. Court-martialed? Yeah, Douglas MacArthur was one of the people on his court-martial. And he was court-martialed from out of the service, pretty much. Jeez Louise. But he also, after the war, proved that air power was effective by sinking a battleship using just a German, a derelict German battleship using American planes off of Newport News. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. MacArthur. Named- huh. MacArthur. Court-martialed Billy Mitchell? Yeah. Uh, roust the uh, bonus army, you know, mess up in the Philippines. That's right. Come on. What are you doing? What are you, Douglas? Which is crazy to think that Douglas MacArthur graduated from West Point in like 1900 or 1901, and he was still fighting in the Korean War in 1951. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. He He was in his 70s and he was still a general. He was a general in 1918 in... (laughs) In the First World War, and a general in 1951 in Korea. Huh. Did he do anything in Veracruz or any of that other stuff? No, I don't know if he did. I don't think so. Mm. But, because really, most of the fighting in, like, the Banana Wars was Marines. But there's some Army stuff, the Veracruz thing, some expeditions into Mexico and all that. Patton, the punitive, you know, the Pancho Villa. Yeah, expedition. deadliest warrior, after all, you know? Ah, ah. Pancho Villa. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh... No, actually, it's interesting. They actually, what prompted the, the expedition against Pancho Villa is they actually attacked over the border and raided a town called Columbus, Mexico, mm. New Mexico, New Mexico, and did some damage there. And there's a really, I never knew much about the Columbus raid until I read some story about it. And actually was heavily, a large part of, the, of it being repulsed actually happened because there's an army unit in the area that had these like machine guns that were like, that fed off of, sim- they're kind of like Hotchkiss machine, machine guns a little bit, but they fed off those strips, like 20 round strips. And apparently yeah. they killed a lot of the, the Pancho Villa soldiers who were killed in the attack were killed by those because some of the units had some there. It's pretty crazy. Huh. Yeah. It's an interesting, put it in a tray. The Japanese did that too. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it would work that well. Doesn't it leave the, the casings in the thing? No, I think the casings are ejected. And then okay. the strip goes through and you put another one in. Okay. Uh, it's, but the guns that fire like that have a much lower rate of fire, probably probably 400 to 500 rounds a minute cyclic hmm. versus, you know, an MG42, which is like 1,200. <laughs> it sounds like canvas ripping is how people describe it. <laughs> it <laughs> it's like a saw or whatever. Yeah, pretty much. Hmm. And then you can't even hear the individual shots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, uh, but nothing beats the Gatling. Well, according to that episode of <laughs> Deadliest Warrior, <laughs> the good. Gatling is the best gun. It, it's got a better red fire, huh? <laughs> It's not better than the Vickers, I would say. Yeah, uh, I would say that's correct as well. <laughs> well, here's the problem: you got to crank the thing. Maybe it does shoot more, but like you know, <laughs> I mean, the, the when you put a, like when you put an electric motor in it and you turn it into a minigun, it's an awesome, yeah, gun. But um, just nothing ask, beats the M2 Browning, man. Just ask the Ma Deuce. It's a classic. Yeah, it is. It is a classic because all the ripoffs of it are terrible. Like those germ, those Soviet fifties. Yeah. Nah, man. Nah, man. Uh, nah. I like how in uh, Russia they call the Maxim the Makshim. Makshim? Oh, yeah. Like Makshim Gorky. Makshim Gorky. Did you know that during the 1920s, Makshim Gorky mm-hmm. wrote a letter to Herbert Hoover. Hubert Hoover. Hubert Hoover uh, during the uh, famine that was happening there saying like, Herbert, you need to help us. You know, you did so much great things after World War One. You need to come here and did the same thing here and... He did. He started the ARA, uh, uh, the American Relief Association, I think is what that stands for, mm-hmm. saved millions of people, fed mm-hmm. like millions and millions of people every day. And uh, Maxim Gorky wrote him a letter afterwards saying like, Herbert, what you've done here will echo through history as one of the most noble and wonderful things any human being has ever done. And your name will be lauded throughout all of history. And now no one knows Remember, anything about, about this. It. It's totally unfair. Yes, it well, is totally unfair. But well, Herbert Hoover was a pretty good guy. He was a great guy. Mm-hmm. A great guy, you know? J. Edgar, well. I don't know as much about him, but probably not a, yeah. as great of a guy. Well, he uh, he was a real institution. He was a real institution. Have you ever saw that movie J. Edgar? I did not. With, uh, it was okay. With um, Leonardo DiCaprio. 
frankly, too handsome to be Jed Gr- you ever seen <laughs> Edgar Hoover. Not exactly. A... They they put a lot of makeup on him to make him uglier. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of facial and prosthetics. And then they had um like this is Star Trek or something. Yeah. <laughs> and then they had a. <laughs> Funny thing about it is, like, then there's always those rumors about J. Edgar Hoover as a cross dresser, which is even funnier. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not. Who knows? Who it's knows? a weird thing. Nobody can prove it. Yeah. Nobody knows. Unless there's that picture. Unless someone's got a picture out there and they're hiding it. No. Nah. Nah. Honestly, at this point, it would have gotten out. No one, no one would would sit on something like that. Right. Right. So, uh, with this short story compilation, what do you think could be done better if they made an alternate presidents too? What would you like to see from well, that? We should do some more modern ones. This this book came out in the early 90s. So, like, you know, there's a lot that's happened in the 25 or so years since this book came out. I mean, it's crazy to me that they did this short story anthology, right? And then nothing else. No more alternate presidents. Whereas you have alternate generals one, two, three, mm-hmm. you know. Like, come on, presidents are so rich for alternate history I fun. I was pretty good overall. I think the the break up, it, there was some the very the stories were pretty good and nice variety, and you know mm-hmm. not everything was from the president's perspective and stuff like that. So. Yeah, a twenty eight I think feels like a little bit overkill. It is too many, too many. Just just pare it down. Some focus. Of the smaller ones are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need more Dukakis. Need more Dukakis. More. Give me alternate a, Dukakis. Give me a real Dukakis story. All right, you know. Yeah. Alternate it's, it's, Dukakis. It's alternate Duk- Alternate Dukakis one. <laughs> Twenty eight short stories about Michael Dukakis. <laughs> Edited by Michael Resnick. <laughs> um, Edited by Walter Mondale. Oh, interesting. Oh, now that's that's one you didn't expect. Edited by George H. W. Bush. <laughs> poppy oh poppy that's what they call him poppy poppy p-o-p-p-y within the family or yes i think so okay i would not call him poppy if i met him (laughs) pop (laughs) dad poppy poppy up up (laughs) Uh, what a guy great socks great socks socks he swears crazy socks interesting he was president during the soviet union ending yeah he was how crazy is that single-handedly that was him yeah, he, he was, was also the first all. U.S. envoy to China and the, the head of the CIA. Yeah, he was in an episode of The Simpsons. He really? Yeah, really. He he became the Simpsons' neighbor. It was after he lost the election. I mm-hmm. think maybe one or two years afterwards. Oh my God. And um, he was like, there was a joke about him writing his memoir. Bart destroys it. He like <laughs> throws it into an outboard motor and it gets chopped up. And he's like. <sighs> And he tries to kill Bart. He like he he, he says like, "Let me teach you something I learned in the CIA." And then pulls a garrote wire out of his <laughs> out of his watch oh <laughs> and tries to kill Bart. But it's actually the he actually it's voiced it. Yeah. it. I'm pretty sure it's really him. We should confirm that. But I, that sounds he, it sounds like he'd do that. I mean, The Simpsons was popular enough at that point that probably someone would. In the, like the mid '90s, that was like yeah. the height of its popularity. Michael Jackson was in it. Was you know. He he did not. This is it's very weird, but he didn't credit himself. He was mm-hmm. a cameo, but it's mm-hmm. obviously him, mm-hmm. like the king of pop, the king of pop himself. Hmm. There's the, something I would want from an alternate presidents too. Mm-hmm. More Warren G. Harding. What are you need doing? More, we need more Coolidge, more Warren G. Harding, more Franklin Pierce. Uh, more Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie. Yeah. Bugs Bunny makes a joke about Wendell Wilkie in an episode. Yeah, that's the one. He hits a guy over the head and goes, Wendell Wilkie! Which is really funny. At the time, when you're a kid, you have no idea what that means. But it's kind of like a Wendell Wilkie joke. Uh, A Wilkie man. Wilkie man. I'm a Wilkie man. You're a Wilkie man? What about an Alton Parker man? Alton Parker man? He ran in 1904 against Teddy Roosevelt. Everyone forgets Alton. Yeah, I sure did. (laughs) They only remember Alton Brown now. Wait, Taft didn't run against T.R.? Now, you did in, oh, in 12, 1912 when he was oh, Bull Moose, but in 08 right. he ran against. Right. This is the Democrat. Okay, I understand well, now. Well, wait. Who was that? Was, was William Jennings Bryan? No, William Jennings Bryan was, was he 08? I guess he was. Because 1896, 1900, and 1908. You know. Because 1904 was Alton Parker. When, uh, Herbert, and then 1912, yeah. yeah. When uh, Herbert Hoover was at Stanford University, mm-hmm. he was a uh, an impresario. Mm-hmm. He uh, arranged for people to come speak at the university, and one of the people he arranged for was William Jennings Bryan. Oh, wow. 
two two cross ships. Of gold. Do not crossify this country in a cross of gold. We need the silver standard. I don't understand the difference, honestly. I don't understand what makes it so. Silver is more plentiful than gold. Okay, so money's worth less. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Why is we that need a good more thing? Money. I don't know. Huh. <laughs> William Jennings Bryan. Someone, well, someone once said about him, they said his mind is like a soup dish. It's wide, but if you juggle any of it, it'll split over, spill over into your lap, which I think is pretty funny. You know who else likes silver? Uh, the Qing Dynasty. They Ooh. really like silver Ooh, a lot. Oh. Yeah. It, it ain't no dynasty unless it's run by uh, the Taipings. Oh, now there's a... There's the a, younger brother of Jesus. And it's a one-person dynasty as well. Yeah. The best dynasty. That's right. Um, I like the Ming Dynasty. Really, you're a big fan of the Ming Dynasty. Well, I like the their their great portions of the Great Wall are really well preserved. So okay, like that. that's pretty cool. I like the Tang Dynasty. The Tang mm. Dynasty is really cool. Not a big fan of the Qing, mainly because like Manchu, like freaking Manchuria. Who cares? Yeah, and it's they're all re- about that Hunan province. Hunan. Yeah. yeah. Now you're talking. Yeah. yeah mm, Hunan chicken. Mm. <laughs> that makes and me uh, the the Manchu writing style. Like, what are you doing? I haven't seen it. But if, if you look on the back of Anyone a, who came up with Poo Yi, get out. Get the heck out. Get out. There. You mean the head of Manchuko. Manchuko, yes. The sacred inviolate territory of Manchuko. If you if you look at the back of a Chinese Yuan, mm-hmm. there's I think five different languages. There's hmm. the uh Mandarin Chinese, and then there's um like Turkish because of uh the, the Uyghurs. Uh, yeah, the Uyghurs. And then there's uh uh manchurian script also what which yeah it's like that is that i didn't even know that was a thing that was a, well actually do you know what maybe it's mongolian it's actually mongolian it is i think they're the same style it's like that cramped it's a vertical script so it's like each word is a vertical like thing so it's it doesn't work really in formatting with no, most it <laughs> most you can't things formatted on pdf yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but there's also English and some other language too. I can't remember. Uh, I'm trying to think because yeah, well, Cantonese is written the same. It's just pronounced. Yeah, way. yeah, it's just different, different pronunciation. That's why in China you watch television. There's um, character subtitles because like what they're saying vocally, mm-hmm. they can't understand. But if they read the the characters, it's like okay, now I get what's going on. That's like their so which we is, have to go to Mandarin Chinese. <laughs> That's what it's such a bizarre thing because that's the Beijing dialect. Well, yeah, but more people probably speak Cantonese and Mandarin natively, although I'm sure now a lot of people do speak Mandarin because it's taught. Tons of people speak Mandarin now, yeah, yeah. But in the early days, absolutely. What do they speak in Fujian province, though? Fujian, Fujian, it's a province sort of like right across from Taiwan. Uh, excuse me, Formosa, Formosa, one Formosa policy. (laughs) Every time I see that, I just die laughing. (laughs) One Formosa policy. Well, like all the cities have their own little 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 intricacies mm-hmm. to them. Like Shanghai in, does too. In Tianjin, they don't say hen. I'm sorry, hen, as in like very. Mm-hmm. They say burr. So it's not hen, it's not oh, hen hao. Confusing. It's burr hao. Burr hao. Burr hao, not hen hao. Yeah. Oh jeez. Burr why? Not. Burr. But really? That's really. <sighs> And it's so weird, you know. But the character, well, where do they? But the characters are the same. The characters which, uh, the same. <laughs> the, the writing style is the same. It's just that the way you pronounce it is completely different. Well, yeah, it's like practically another language, almost. Yeah, almost. Not exactly, but. Well, you know, Cantonese has a different number of tones. Cantonese has like six tones, yeah. whereas Mandarin's only got what four, kind of five. Um, it's weird. In a in Chinese class, I would always do with all my H's, I'd like Chen Hao, Chen Hao, Chen Hao. You're not supposed to do that. Xie xie. That is not how it's pronounced. Ah, tama. Xie xie. Uh, 我的头发 shi hong si. I'm sorry, hong si. Hong si. I also can't remember any tones at all. Neither can I. I can remember Zhong Guo. Zhong Guo. That's about it. Mei Ren. Mei Ren. Um, what is MSG again? Wei Ji. Wei Ji. Yeah, Mei O Wei Ji. What the Mingzi Shu? What the Mingzi Ma Ke Si. Ma Ke Si. Ma Su. Ma Su. Interesting. Not Ma Te. No, we said Man Su, and then I changed it to Ma Su. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You know what Ma Ke Si is, right? Marks. Marks. 
Yeah, Karl Marx. <laughs> yeah. What about Engels? Engels. Da Husa. Da Husa. Oh, yeah, Da Husa. Yeah, yeah of course. Figured. Don't forget about that. Um, yeah, guys, we once studied Chinese. Yeah, both of us. Max remembers a little bit more than I do. Well, I took it way longer than, than you did. did. Yeah. And I actually went to China. So well, I've been to China. Oh, that's right. You did, too. Yeah. But I went when I was a kid, so. Yeah, I was there for two months. How long were you there? About a week and a half. They, well, that's still pretty long, honestly. I mean, honestly, you can probably get everything you need out of China in a week and a half. Yeah, well, we did Hong Kong, Beijing, and Shanghai. I'd like to have gone to Xi'an to see the, the Karakata Warriors. I've, say, seen, I've seen... Pretty, it was pretty cool, I would guess. Xi'an's pretty interesting because you got the, uh, the um, Hui people are there, mm-hmm. which are like the half Turkish, half uh, uh, Chinese people. So they mm-hmm. look different than normal Chinese people. They're, they're obviously racially different mm-hmm. from you know Han Chinese. Yeah. And Which is like 95% of the population's Han. Yeah, yeah. Although if you go down to like Yunnan province or out far west, they're different, which is interesting. Yeah, it is. There's even some like Vietnamese in the very far southern part on the Vietnamese border, yeah, which would yeah. make sense. It does make sense. Considering there's ethnic Chinese all over. You go to Singapore. Malaysia. Malaysia. Indonesia. Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia. Even the Philippines. Even the Philippines. Emilio Aguinaldo. Look at a picture of Emilio Aguinaldo. He was part, she was part ethnically Chinese. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. Even in India, there's an immigrant community there. Well, if you go into like places like Sikkim, like that mm-hmm. area, like they're different. They're not like Dravidians or the, um, um, what are the other? There's a whole bunch. Yeah. Well, if you go to those parts of like far eastern India, like on the Burmese border, those are very different too. Like close to Bangladesh and whatnot. Yeah, like close to yeah Burma, that those parts like Kohima and Kohima and Imphal, where all those big battles were fought. Mm. The only about the only place you can find people eating beef in India. You can also find them eating beef in Kerala on the southern coast as well. I remember they're... watching Anthony Bourdain did a show. It was it was it Anthony Bourdain or or Gordon Ramsay. One of them went to Kerala and they he's like they're like cooking beef in India and he was like shocked by it. And they made this dish and he said it was literally whoever it was said it was like the spiciest thing they ever tried. It looked it, really good though. Is it are they is it because they're Buddhist or because they're, they're Christian? Buddhist. They're Buddhist or Christian. Either way they they're not Hindus, obviously. But right. obviously yeah, they're yeah, not yeah. Hindus. Or Muslims. Or Muslims. Well, Muslims can't eat beef, but a lot of them don't in India because of the there's a real like the stigma. The stigma of it is a yeah. big deal. Yeah, it makes so. sense. Burma campaign, World War II. Burma, what a terrible camp. Holy crap, fighting yeah. in the Burma campaign was awful. One of the worst. They said, other than being, like, if you were a British soldier, like, the worst place for a British, like, serviceman to be was either in the Bomber bomber Command or Burma hmm. were the two worst places to be. Like, because of the rates of casualties were so high in bomber camp, the Bomber campaign and the, the disease and stuff in Burma was just atrocious. Like the Chindits working with uh, yeah. Wingate? Or Wingate. I can't even, re- I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing about, there was some British doctor who's still alive from that area, is like well into his hundreds, and he was a, a prisoner of war, and he said, like, medically, we saw conditions during that time that do not exist anymore. Hmm. You don't see them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe if you live in Burma, maybe. you see them. But, like, things that, like, you just couldn't even imagine, they weren't prepared for, you know, hmm. just because there's even stuff that they didn't really know about, and people getting it, and all sorts of things like that, so... I feel kind of bad because when we talked about the Pacific Theater, we didn't mention Burma like at all in that episode. It got kind of short shrift, yeah. Yeah, people forget Merrill's about Merrill's Marauders, it. the Chindits. Yeah, that's where our that's where Steven Spielberg's dad served was in Burma. Really? A, and a, well, there's a, actually it's interesting enough. Like in China and Burma, the largest U.S. presence there was USAAF, was Air Force presence. You know, they mm-hmm. were that was the big presence was like the bo- the American contribution in planes and stuff like that was way bigger than infantry the only american infantry unit that fought on mainland asia during the war as far as i recall were the merrill's marauders in burma okay other than that the united states did not contribute like there was no divisions and stuff like that contributed to land land fighting but there's a whole lot of air units Hmm. i mean actually the first b-29 raids were staged out of india really in china yeah so the first b-29 raids (laughs) were um I think it was June 5th, 1944, was a B-29 raid when that hit somewhere in Burma. They were raiding Bangkok, um, which was like, there was like a raid from like like part of India to Bangkok, which was like the longest raid by airplane attack in the war by distance roundabout. And they actually moved the B-29 units into southern China in 44. And actually the first bombardment by B-29 was actually they could hit parts of Japan. It was huh. the Iwata Metalworks in western Japan were actually bombed by B-29s from China. And part of the the impetus for 
Operation I Go, which was a massive Japanese campaign in 44 in China, was to overrun B-29 bomber sites. And then they shifted the B-29s to Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. So so the, these B-29s, they, when, when they would fly from China to Japan, would they go back to China or would they keep flying no, to some fly other back. base? No, they okay. fly back. Yeah, because I know when the Doolittle Doolittle raid, raid happened, they flew over Japan and then kept going to Xinjiang, actually. Yeah. And there was like an operation yeah. by the Japanese to go catch them. And they caught yeah. a few some of them. Some of them, they executed some of them. One Doolittle Raider is still alive. Mm. The co-pilot, Doolittle's co-pilot, still alive. Robert and, Cole, 102 years old. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. One of the B-25s landed in Russia and they were interned for like two years. <laughs> what? There, which makes no sense because they were our allies. But like... Maybe they were just trying to get in good with the Japanese. It's like, oh, we're not at war with you, Japan. No, we're not. We're not. Uh, but soon... But soon... And sooner than you may think. They think. <laughs> but alternate presidents, though. A fine book. A fine book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Is it the best of the Resnick? One of them, yeah. One of them. I like alternate warriors a lot, too. The Gandhi one's good. <laughs> we, need to, we need to check that out. Oh, yeah. Well, I've read it, but you can read it. I think you've got it now. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. You know, before we go, just want to say, if you want to contact us, you can do so at talkingithistory at gmail.com. Uh, We're always so. open for suggestions. Hmm. We're always looking for new stuff. Or comments or, you know, whatever. This is Matt signing off. And this is Max signing off. Have a good day, guys.